Like a diamond, light em up in the dark we Thank you for tuning in to our very first episode of The Voices Talk Show. My name is Josette Ciceron. Today our panelists will be discussing diversity in Alexandria. Um, stay tuned to the end of the episode to catch my personal story behind creating Voices Talk Show. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for tuning in to our very first episode of The Voices Talk Show. Today we will be discussing diversity in Alexandria and our unique experiences with racism, discrimination, and acceptance within our community. Joining me today will be... Hi, I'm Deb Ledoux and I am currently the chair of the Inclusion Network and I've lived in Alec for about 15 years now. And I'm Nathan, I'm the environmental coordinator with Pope Douglas Solid Waste. I was born in Alexandria and I returned to the area in 2009. I am pretty on John Feist. Uh, it has been four and a seven months uh, since I've been here in Alexandria. It's my home now. And um, I work with Inclusion Network um, and been community member here. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it. What has been your experiences with acceptance and diversity in this community? Um, I do English language tutoring with a group of people in this town. Most of them are Spanish speakers. And there's this one little boy, he's about 10 years old, elementary school. He has a smile that can light up the world. Just an amazing young man. And he was telling me that he was out in the community with his sister, who's a couple years older, and another friend. And this other young kid came up and started calling him the N-word. And I said, well, well, what did you do? And he said, well, he just turned and walked away. And I can't even imagine how it must make these three children feel to hear somebody call them that. Plus, he says to me, and I'm not even black, I'm Hispanic. <laughs> And I mean, I was angry, I was frustrated, and I was hurt for him. Yeah, I, I really definitely understand that and I relate because I think that um, people don't realize that when you hear that word in the traditional form, it sounds completely different when you're, when it, you're being attacked with that word. Mm -hmm. um, so of course most people of color have probably, or even everybody, <laughs> at this point it's 2019, so we've all heard lyrics, you know, music and, um, and where the word is used, but there's something different when it's actually addressed to you um, that just changes something in you because you know that it's not camaraderie, it's not like hey, you're, you're my friend, it's more of a, this, there's something wrong with you and you're automatically put in a position of feeling ostracized or that something is wrong with you. And that's the problem, it's mm -hmm. like you, when, when people do that to you, it's like you have that feeling of, well, violence and viol violence, you know, using violence f um, on violence obviously isn't going to mm -hmm. work, but you yeah. still, everyone still has that within them. Um, so I think people need to take the high road, which you know, you can only do so much, so yeah. that's, that's good that you're having us here today to kind of talk about what, you know, how those things do impact the community and, um, you know, toxic, you know, relationships in the community can really bring community spirit yeah. down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, piggybacking that, um, I'm, uh, I've lived here for four and a half years. I am a South Asian woman, um, the only Nepali in Alexandria, mm -hmm. and it has been a very experience uh, interesting experience um, because of my networks because uh, of my husband who's white I have a lot of resources you know I have networks I meet people so it's easy I wouldn't say it's completely easy for me to adapt uh, this homogenous community but it has helped whereas I see a lot of my other people of color friends or even LGBTQI folks in the community they're hurting because they don't have the enough resources we um, are not being able to try to even understand what they're going through yeah. so maybe you know the best door the best option for us right now would be to just be active listeners and just open our minds and and we go Crazy. from there so I really appreciate you creating this voices for us and you know inclusion network being part of it 
this has been a huge uh, work for us uh, in order to bring the grassroots level mm -hmm. of work around inclusivity. So thank you. Yeah. And in addition to opening our minds, opening our hearts. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, my overall goal with all of this is really to humanize everybody's experience. Whether you're gay, you're straight, whether you're black, white, purple, blue, it really shouldn't matter. We all have the right to coexist. Um, and I think that um, I've been here for almost four years. This is actually my fourth summer here. And from the very beginning, um, it's always been right like in my face. It's the first thing that everybody notices. And of course, I can't change it any more than you can. So um, there's always this conversation around it or even um, this draw towards touching my hair or doing things that, while it might not seem like a big deal to other people, when you're living in that skin and you experience it on a daily basis, it's, it's a little bit like being in a zoo. And you're yeah, a circus you're animal, right? Yeah. Like, don't touch my hair. I don't want to sound like I'm being overly dramatic, but it's, yeah. it's true because um, after a while, yeah. it's like, okay, for example, me and Preeti, we've gone to, we've been in public together. And one of the very first things that happens um, when we walk into a room together, regardless if the people know us or they don't know us, they immediately kind of draw themselves to us and what's the first thing that happens? They put their hands. Slowly bring their <laughs> hand and just touch the hair. Yeah. And what was really interesting as a, another person of color, right? I'm looking at her, I'm walking with her and already 12, 10, 12 <laughs> people already just coming and trying to touch her and just violating her space. I realized my privilege right at that moment. Gosh, I don't have to deal with that every single day. Gosh, I don't have to feel like, you know, I'm, I, I'm just not a human anymore. At, at least I don't have to feel that way. But I do want to say that for other people of color, there is a very different kind of um, entanglement too that we also have to recognize and, and give, that, give voice to that. Yeah, I mean, I think be, be Within the greater picture, there, there's the discrimination, but then um, when it comes down to race and, stu and such, it would just, it mostly comes down to colorism mm -hmm. in the sense of what other people see as threatening or interesting or just are drawn to. And I mean, moving into this community, it's obvious, you know, I'm black, you know, you know it, I know it, we should know it together. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just in the sense of like, I have, I, I'm being me on, I, I'm leading this life regularly and I don't walk up to you and do things that make you uncomfortable like putting my hands directly on you without asking first mm -hmm. or approaching you. It's just that in any other situation with anyone else, especially a person who's white, that wouldn't happen. Um, the overwhelmingness of like always having to be in a place where you're teaching mm -hmm. um, because it takes away from like, well, I'm Joe. <laughs> I'm, I just want to get to know you, you know, I just want to be treated normal. And um, I appreciate your interest in what I look like or what I'm bringing um, into your space, but it, it has to be done in a respectful manner. You know, um, and we all have privilege, like you said, we all have, I have privilege in some spaces as a yeah. woman, I have privilege in some spaces as a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, privilege doesn't mean that, you know, your life wasn't hard or that mm -hmm. you didn't do anything um, to deserve what you have. It just means that your skin color was not the reason why that was hard in terms of white privilege is what I'm saying. Um, and I think that I, I've gotten into a lot of those conversations and um, it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's exhausting in a sense to be a person of color, especially in a community that is not exposed enough to what is regular and normal. And even like, you know, um, different religious backgrounds or sexual yeah. orientation or gender identity too, it's kind of that same conversation yeah. that you have to have. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, I'm a gay man, I'm married. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, when did you realize that you were gay? And it's like, well, I don't think that's okay to ask that. It's not your business, <laughs> right? but you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like, it's almost your... like that, uh, that kind of touching of the hair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, mm -hmm. well, that's not really your, your, your business. Yes. 
um, we're not to that point. You just right. met me a, as a person from the community. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, well, your husband. It's like, who wears the dress and all this other stuff? You know, yeah. people. I don't know if people do that just because they're really naive, mm -hmm. or just they're trying to break the ice. But I, there are some offensive ways that people can go about that stuff. Yeah, I think you know. Again, adding to that hyper visibility, right? Constant uh, asking of questions because of the way you look because you're different. Mm -hmm. And then that invisibility when you're going as an adult. I'm an adult, but I get treated like a little Asian gal. Mm -hmm. That's what people call me, a little Asian gal. And my strive then comes to, you know, pushing forward and saying, no, please treat me like an adult uh, it, uh, as a leader in, the, in this community, right? So it's this balance between hyper visibility where you're constantly seen as this really different person and then you're invisible you can't mm -hmm. you, you you can't show your work because you're not there mm -hmm. and i think people expect especially both of you to know everything about anybody yep. <laughs> you are the representation for the entire black race here's the newsletter don't you know that person right? just yeah. because she's black doesn't mean i know her right and, and i know it sounds bizarre but i've legitimately <laughs> yep. been asked hey like can you come to my house for dinner and just you know expose my family to the black race and to give us a history lesson and while I know what they're saying is more like I want to, you know, I want to be able to have diversity in my life. I want to show my kids. I want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, it comes off as like, well, let me have a token black person in my life, and that'll make me feel some somewhat better than the rest. And 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 I get again, I I totally come into it with understanding of knowing that what's different is is always going to be a little bit harder to understand and but I just want to bring it back to the fact that we're all human mm -hmm. you know and we're all living these experiences and when you're a, min a minority in any kind of mm -hmm. you know uh, conversation you're actually the only person who everybody's asking for information about mm -hmm. and I'm proud to be a black woman I'm proud to be a Haitian black American woman um, but I don't represent every other black woman no. out there, you know, I really, or other black people in general. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that it's on the majority to find it in their space to just chill. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, just approach us like you would approach anybody else. And then due time, those things will come out those conversations will happen, but it's not gonna happen within the first five seconds of you walking up to me mm -hmm. in the grocery store while my kids are screaming and I'm supposed to mm -hmm. all of a sudden give you a lesson on culture and race. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, just know? say, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. You don't have to have this nervous, <laughs> kind of like, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's, it's exhausting because if you think about it, that happens so often here. Mm -hmm. and and that's probably I think that I like do you guys feel that this community is like aware of like their privilege and the things that they do that makes other people feel as a white so. male I definitely recognize that mm -hmm. you know I, I totally do um, but then you know um, it's, it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, in conversations and stuff, like, well, what does your wife do? And I'm like, I don't have a wife, you know? <laughs> I remember I was talking to a, 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 an elected official um, in, um, in Minnesota, and then, and then I said, no, I got married. Um, it just, you know, when it, when it was, became legal. And then she said, well, that's, that's, your, own, um, that's your own beliefs, or that's your, um, you know, <laughs> kind of like each to their own type of deal. Like, mm -hmm. I'm trying, like, I'm something that's less than, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, and, and then you, it, see, then you get that anger because I know that she is a single mother that got divorced. So it's like, well, what makes you better then? You know, mm -hmm. why didn't you work that out? You know what I mean? So, yeah. it, so you, you know, that's that trigger thing about Yeah, bringing with that. back to dehumanizing, mm -hmm. right? It's so yeah. easy to dehumanize people just by words. Um, I get called quite a lot of words. Um, one of the word that really hurts is you know, oriental. Um, oriental is a word, it's a term used for things. Um, and you're and definitely I'm, not a thing. And I'm definitely <laughs> not a thing. So 
I think we have to start recognizing what are we using in terms of our language, in terms of communicating. Um, I think it's the, isn't it, isn't it just a matter of fact that sitting together and just having that deeper conversation about what ticks you off and what doesn't, um, that would help a lot. Okay, so just to wrap this conversation up, um, what are the things specifically you think this community can do to actually help um, promote inclusivity? I would like to see our community leaders take a stand that mm -hmm. we need to have inclusion and diversity for everybody. I agree. You see churches that have billboards, all are welcome here. I'd like to see a big sign when you drive into Alexandria that says all are welcome here. Mm -hmm. And nice. it would be great. I, it's one thing for us to sit here and say that, but for the community leaders to say, no, we believe that and here's our support it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, um, you know, I've, I've talked to, you know, some of the the um, staff at like some of the Hispanic or Mexican restaurants, mm -hmm. and I was like, "How come there isn't a Cinco de Mayo here?" You know, everywhere yeah. else it seems like there there is one, <laughs> and so I think you know, kind of back to what you're saying about city, um, you know, leadership and just mm -hmm. support. It'd be nice if they were approaching, um, you know, groups like that mm -hmm. that are not as, um, you know, their voice isn't as um, loud to kind of encourage them to do some stuff right. like that. Like, maybe there should be a rainbow flag um, during the month of June for Pride um, at, at City Hall, and maybe there should be a Cinco de Mayo, yeah. and maybe there should be, you know, something more festivals. inclusive, uh, just festivals in general, because mm -hmm. food definitely brings people, people together. together. Yeah. yeah, and I agree with all of that. You know, creating activities, create, creating inclusive uh, environment so that we can tap into every possible dimension of being a healthy community, but at the same time, we also have to be very, very aware of the fact that people of color have already too much in their plate, mm -hmm. you know? And so I get this all the time. When, when are we gonna have an Indian restaurant? Guess what? I'm not Indian first, <laughs> and guess what? I didn't go to school to uh, open an in, in Indian restaurant. We, we need to start asking those questions to our leaders, to our community, and say, where are these, wh why don't we have diversity here? Or why, don't, why aren't we bringing these things in our community? Maybe that would be a better question to the leaders, and then we come up with plans. I agree. I think um, it's all about the community taking some sort of accountability Absolutely. to um, make an effort. Um, it'd be nice to start with putting people of color in those spaces, you know? asking us absolutely know? I mean just seeing what what's up guys you know just bringing us into these conversations including um, activities that are not just directed to a specific group of people but all kinds of people and and trying to make sure that we're all being heard and we're all being seen but I want to thank you all for being here today um, I really appreciate you guys coming on this journey with me and doing the very first episode with me. Um, our goal here at Voices is to actually give everybody a voice, those who have it and those who don't feel like they have one. Um, our entire mission is to educate, provide insight, share stories, and just bring humanity to these conversations of differences. We're gonna dive into sexual assault, um, mental health which is a big component and all sorts of ideas um, because the idea is to make sure that we're in a community that's aware that's moving forward and evolving um, and listening most of all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Josette Ciceron and I'm the associate editor of the local Defend of Women magazine. And I'm also the volunteer administrative team member of the Inclusion Network, a group of dedicated, passionate people with a common goal to make central Minnesota an inclusive and welcoming place for people of all backgrounds to live and work. Our goal is to strengthen the region through appreciation and understanding of diversity and cultural differences. 
Together with the support of the Inclusion Network, Voices was created, a panel-based talk show that brings everyday members of our community to discuss and explore tough conversations that affect our society and community, from racial tension and discrimination to sexual assault and most importantly, mental health. Voices aims to bridge the gap between those who feel heard and those who feel unheard. Believing that the first step to healing, understanding, and change is to begin with an open, honest conversation and shared experiences, Voices ultimate goal is to provide insight, educate, and humanize experiences like my own. My family and I moved to Alexandria about four years ago. The decision literally came overnight after finding ourselves on the losing end of a struggling Florida job market. Needing a reset of sorts, we took my brother and sister-in-law up on their offer to move to Alexandria for a few months so we could work and save up. I didn't know anything about Alexandria. In fact, I didn't even look up the town until the night before we boarded the plane and left the only home we'd ever truly known. Outside of our family and their friends, we were met with indifference almost immediately. From being stared at at the grocery store to people straight up telling us we didn't belong, my very first face-to-face -face encounter was very public at a grocery store. An elderly woman randomly walked up to me and began calling me the N-word and went on shouting about how people like me had ruined her hometown. I was so taken back by the incident, I left the store almost immediately crying all the way home thinking we had just made the biggest mistakes of our lives and moving our family here. In the first two years, the incidents went from microaggressions like, you're so pretty for a black girl and you speak so well, to macroaggressions like people refusing to get on an elevator with me and my baby, and the catalyst to my anxiety and depression, my husband's accidental arrest outside of our home. So, it was a little after, a week or so, after the Philando Castile murder that one morning, I was dropping my brother off at the VA. And on my way home from dropping him off at the VA, I was driving down the street and I was passing a police officer. I did the usual check, checked my mirrors, speed, seat belt, everything was good. I passed the officer and in my rear view I saw that he hit a quick U-turn. I knew he was coming for me. I went and pulled into my driveway and he came in right after me with the lights on. And as I figured, okay, this is probably just gonna get stopped, check my ID, regular stop. Uh, he started giving me instructions through the speaker. That's when I realized it was not a regular stop. And I followed all his instructions, got the vehicle, backed up to him. By this time, four or five more officers already showed up. One of them I saw was an undercover cop car too. Um, I had, gotten to him and he cuffed me and I asked him what I was being arrested for. He told me it was for a violation of probation. I told him he definitely had the wrong guy and he told me I was identified down the street by one of their detectives. So standing there, after I told him to check my ID, I was already a wreck by this time, wondering, oh my God, what's gonna happen? My family's gonna see me in the window. What if my neighbors see me? So I had asked him to put me in the back of the cop car so that my neighbors didn't see me. So I did not want any more trouble, especially from this incident. Um, after I was in the car for some time, the same officer took me out the car and he apologized once they identified me and then told me that they were still looking for the guy and I would probably be followed to work if I went out anytime soon. So when I got inside and told my wife of the incident, she was devastated. She was horribly devastated that I could have lost my life in that moment. So I went to work later on that day and sure enough, I was followed to work. And I even took a different route to work and I was still followed all the way till I got to work and actually parked. It was frustrating, very frustrating to be followed to work after the incident. I, I figured they, they knew they, knew, they knew their mistake and it felt like 
they're continuing the same mistake and just made me feel like I just wasn't supposed to be there. Just, I hated being there. I really wanted to leave this place. This one broke me. All I could think of was how their mistake could have been the difference between my children having a father or not. The assumption that he was who they thought he was without even bothering to ask him to identify himself, it was infuriating. Because for people like us, being pulled over is a life and death situation. Nobody deserves to be treated that way for simply driving while black. This pushed me into the darkest headspace I'd ever found myself in. I felt unsafe in my own community. We felt violated. I felt like my family was at the mercy of ignorant stereotypes that could not only ruin our lives, they can end them. After about a year of isolation and literally fearing the idea of leaving the house, I began experiencing intense anxiety attacks every time I tried. After a year of isolation, I, was, I wasn't getting any better and I knew I needed help. So I reached out to my doctors and was led to the most incredible hired friend a girl can ask for. After some intense therapy, I began reclaiming my power back and was determined not to allow people who didn't even know me dictate the way I navigated the world. So I wrote my story down. It was one of the most healing experiences and I knew if only one person could hear my story and relate, then maybe I can keep someone else like me from feeling just a little less lonely and ostracized in this community. My story was published last year in the local Definitive Woman magazine and that unleashed a chain of events that changed our lives dramatically. From public health workers to therapists to the incredible staff at the Childhood Education Program, I suddenly found a community of open, understanding, and most of all, accepting individuals who gave me the strength to rewrite my story and reinvent myself after giving up on me and my career. Today, I'm the associate editor of Definitive Woman magazine, and I knew I couldn't just stop there. Shine like a diamond, light them up in the dark. We know who we are, we're a big bright spark